be here today with y'all here in Northwood. Seems like it's been a while. Good to be back. This week is the week that is referred to by many as the Passion Week. This is the week that begins with Jesus coming in to Jerusalem on the donkey. And they hail him as their king. Is that better? Can y'all hear me now? Okay, I'm glad you can hear me now. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and the people put their palm branches down and they even put some of their cloaks there on the street so that he can go into Jerusalem. He, of course, attacks the situation in the temple with the money changers. And during this week, he confronts the religious leaders and he gives a bunch of, of uh, stories or parables to illustrate the problems with, with Israel. One of them, of course, is the story of the vineyard and uh, <clears throat> how they were given responsibility to keep the vineyard um, maintenance and everything. And then there comes that time when Jesus has his last supper with his disciples and he institutes the Lord's Supper. They having their Passover meal at that time. It's referred to by our Jewish brethren as the Seder meal, where they eat the Passover matzah or unleavened bread, if you want to use that term. And of course they have a special meal. This also is a time when the real conflict between good and evil becomes exposed. It becomes very apparent. There are those that want to do the will of God, and yet they don't do the will of God. The Lord himself always accomplishes the will of God, but Jesus has to confront those that are not doing God's will. And it comes to a head. Jesus even tells Apostle Peter that you're going to deny me three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. He is also going to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot for 30 pieces of silver. And then... They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus tells them to sit at a specific place. And then Jesus goes a little bit further and he tells Peter, James, and John to keep watch. The disciples had noticed that Jesus was starting to look differently, that he was different than what he'd been in the past. He began to gain some sort of a kind of a sick color about him. Jesus knows what's getting ready to happen. And you notice in verse 38, he says something of importance here. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved. This is Matthew 26 and verse 38. It says, to the point of death, remain here and keep watch with me. Now, none of us can fully understand the depth of what Jesus is enduring here. But he actually states, he is grieved to the point of death. Jesus knows what is getting ready to happen. He's getting ready to be separated from his eternal father in heaven because 
of the sin of man. In Luke's gospel, it actually states that Jesus sweated as if it were drops of blood. Can you imagine sweating to the point where it comes out like blood? That's the kind of distress that I don't think any of us can really fully understand. All of us here today knows what it's like to be separated from God because we all are sinners, aren't we? We all know what it means to be sinful because that's what we are as people. But Jesus here, who knows no sin, has to find some way to experience this separation from the Father because he had been with the Father from eternity past. See, God the Father and God the Son were always in unison, always together. And yet all of a sudden, Jesus is going to be counted as a sinner. How does Jesus manage to endure this? This is an important question because without Jesus enduring this, enduring this separation, there is no hope for us. Somebody has to experience this separation so that we can get to heaven. Notice verse 39. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Let this cup pass from me. Now, what is Jesus talking about when he says this? Well, I'm one who believes that the Bible should be able to explain and interpret itself. If you go to Isaiah chapter 51, the prophet Isaiah has a good explanation. This is Isaiah 51 and verses 17 and verse 22. Isaiah 51 and verse 17. Rouse yourself, rouse yourself. Arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger. The chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs. And then, of course, we have in verse 22... Thus says the Lord, the Lord, even your God, who contends for his people. Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger. This cup is God's divine wrath on sin. God's divine wrath on sin. From the beginning of time, God has told his people that if you do this, if you create this sin, you shall surely die. He told that to Adam and Eve. Throughout the Bible, Ezekiel wrote that the soul that sins, it shall die. Paul writes that the wages of sin is death. The gulf this separation between the holiness of God and us as sinners is very, very deep. Sin has separated us from God. And if God is going to bring us back into communion with him and into a relationship with him, he has to endure this divine wrath, this cup. And Jesus is pleading Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Because he is asking is maybe there is another way around this. Maybe there is a plan B. In his human nature, he is crying out to the Lord for an answer. Jesus has to now suffer the consequences of man's sin the cost that is too deep for us as sinners to fully understand. As people, we do not realize how deep 
and how profound this separation really is. We know what sin is, and yet Jesus is sinless. He does not know sin. Jesus is grieved to the point of death, and yet after Jesus prays the first time, he finds his disciples sleeping. Notice verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, there is that constant conflict that we have within ourselves as to what the flesh in our being wants and then what the spirit of god is moving in to make happen as well which one gets the victory the disciples fell asleep three times jesus prayed three times to let this cup pass from him and each time he comes back to the disciples and they are sleeping now he told them to keep watch because Jesus knows that something very serious is getting ready to happen. That cup of divine wrath on sin has been passed. Notice in verse 42, and he went away a second time and prayed saying, my father, if this cannot pass away until I drink it, your will be done your will be done. There was no way around it. Jesus has to accept this cup of God's divine wrath on sin. And yet, there's no other way. Jesus accepts this divine plan he accepts the divine wrath of God for sinners. He says, I'm willing to accept the wrath of God to save sinners. Thy will be done. In the book of Desire of Ages, page 690, we have a great statement in regard to what Jesus endures. She writes, Three times he uttered that prayer. Three times has humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's redeemer. He says that the transgression of the law, if left to themselves, if transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes and the lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds its impending fate, and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. He accepts his baptism of blood, and though through him perishing millions may gain everlasting life, he has left the courts of heaven where all is purity and happiness and glory to save the one lost sheep, the one world that is fallen by transgression. And he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that has willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Maybe you've had a time in your life where you've had to go before the Lord and ask him to help you make a decision in your life. You have asked and you have prayed and finally the Lord says, this is what you must do. And you say, my, thy will be done. And you know, of course, when you accept what you believe is God's will, you know that there are going to possibly be consequences for it.
the decision is made, thy will be done. Jesus' divine nature accept God's divine plan to save the world. There is no turning back. And immediately this great conflict continued. Verse 45. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. So Jesus knows what is happening. The fallen, sinful, rebellious state of man. The man that as an enemy to God approaches the holiness and purity and the sinlessness of God himself and takes him away for trial and ultimate execution. In fact, one of these men was a disciple of Jesus Judas Iscariot. We say to ourselves, how can people do the things that Judas Iscariot does? Judas had been with Jesus. He had seen the miracles. He was sent out with the 70 and saw the demons subject in Jesus' name, and yet this man rejects Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. The sinfulness of man confronts the holiness of God right here. God, who is totally innocent and sinless, is now being attacked by the sinfulness of this world. And it's even being attacked by one who walked with Jesus. How do people do these things? I want to read to you a situation that happened in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24, and I'm going to begin here with verse 9. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel under his feet. There appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel. And they saw God and they ate and drank. They saw God on that mountain. It was probably in an angelic form. Now, you would think with an experience like this that it would be truly life-changing. You would think that seeing God upon this mountain would transform them by seeing his presence. Well, if you read a few chapters on, Aaron and the people are dancing around the golden calf. Nadab and Abihu, they were up there, later offered strange fire before the Lord in the tabernacle. 
and they fell dead. What should change people for a long-term basis does not happen. It's not long after this when people turn to their rebellion toward God and they're back to dancing around the golden calf. Judas Iscariot sees all these great miracles of Jesus. He saw demons being cast out in the name of Jesus. He heard all the parables of Jesus. And yet he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. During the dinner, the Passover meal, Peter tells Jesus that I will go to my death and I will never deny you. And Jesus comes in and says, well, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Not once, not twice, three times. You see, there is a Judas, there is a Aaron, there's a Peter in all of us. Because we want so many times to just compartmentalize our faith. We want to go to church and be who we're supposed to be at church, but when we go home, we're not. We go to church and yet when we go to work, we're just like all the other good old boys there as well. Or gals. When we go to school, we're just like all the other students. We just want to blend in and be like all the other kids. We may not be dancing around the golden calf, but we're doing something. When the men come to get Jesus, Judas comes out and he says, the one I'm going to kiss is the one you want. I mean, he, he, he makes sure he gets the, they get the right guy. So Judas, Judas comes up and kisses him. Peter actually takes out a sword and he cuts off the ear of the high priest slave. And then in verse 53, I'll go back to verse 52. It says, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. They're at my disposal right now. <laughs> you better watch out when they come. I want to read something here again in 2 Kings. Some of you may have heard this story. It's a story about uh, how Sennacherib had put a siege around Jerusalem. Second Kings chapter 19, and I'm going to look at verse 35. I'll go back to verse 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there. He will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he will return. He shall not come to this city, declares the Lord, for I will defend this city and give it and save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Verse 35, then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord came out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians, and when the men rose in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home 
and lived at Nineveh. Now that was one angel that took out 185,000 people in one night. Jerusalem was surrounded. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord for deliverance. And the Lord came and did so. If 12 legions of angels would have been called by Jesus, they could have destroyed the whole world. They could have wiped us all out just like that. Twelve legions of angels. Yet Jesus does not call for them. He chose to love instead. He chose to love when we were sinners. When we were in rebellion to God, he still loved us. And Luke's gospel was recorded that when the high priest's slave ear was cut, Jesus still touched his ear and healed him. The ear is cut in hate. Jesus comes back and returns what happened with love. You see, we are, as a people, unable to understand how God can love this much. This man is taking Jesus into custody and taking him into trial and ultimately to his execution, and yet Jesus heals him. Jesus chose to love. Man in his sin can hate and rebel against God, and yet Jesus still loves. He still loves us. This is the love that we, has, his disciples, must learn to have because God loved us. We, in turn, love him back. We live a life of obedience to him because he loved us. So we respond and love him back. The sinfulness and the rebellion of sinful man confronts the holiness and sinlessness of God. When this happens, there's conflict. Things happen when this takes place. When people during the Dark Age period were put to death because of their faith, their faith, it's because the holiness of God they had on their side was against the sinfulness and the rebellion of man. You see, the people that came to arrest Jesus, some of them were part of the religious crowd. It was the religious crowd that was with Jesus whenever they put him on trial. In fact, they were the ones conducting the, the trial. Some may conclude that Jesus suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane and at Calvary because he was just caught and he wasn't very lucky. You know, he, he just got some bad luck and he got caught and was executed. No, what happened here was the divine plan of God being carried out and nothing was going to stop it. God allows the sinfulness and the rebellion of man to put the Son of God, the sinlessness of God, to death. 
to show the fact that he still loves sinners and is willing to forgive them and take them to heaven despite their sinfulness and rebellion toward God. Nothing could have stopped what was going to happen. God's divine will that his son die for us all happened and Jesus accomplished the will of the Father. He asked that the cup would be passed from him, but then he finally had to surrender and said, thy will be done. He chose to love. This is a love that changes us. I remember that day, July 18th, 1981, when God's love hit me like a ton of bricks. I can remember nobody had to tell me to study my Bible anymore because I, before I knew it, I was memorizing it. Nobody had to plead with me to beg me to go to church. I was thrilled to be there. In fact, when church was over, I didn't want to leave. I said, let's just keep praising him. Oh, I grew up in church. They pounded the pulpit, told me I was going to go to hell for all eternity. And then I found out that Jesus loved me. He didn't want me to go to hell. He wanted to take me to heaven. Love that changed me inside and out. Then to answer the call from him, something you never dream of doing, especially after they've been yelling and pounding the pulpit at you all those years growing up. I couldn't do that. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, Paul writes, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given unto us. You see, this love makes a difference. Love makes a difference. Jesus said the two of the greatest commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. See, when he shows this love to us, well, then back to him is not a problem. And then Jesus said we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. When we choose to love, we have a lot less problems. Love finds a way to work through problems and overcome the world. And that is my message for you today in Jesus' name. Amen.